we do say that thank you to our veterans. If you are a veteran, would you please stand this morning so we can recognize you and appreciate the sacrifice that you made for us and our country. Thank you so much. God bless you. We're grateful to have you here. We're grateful for your sacrifice and also for the sacrifice of our great God and his son, Jesus Christ, who puts a new song in our heart this morning.
you say hallelujah? Would you say hallelujah? I hope God has put a new song in your heart this morning. It is great to have you at Wings of Faith. I asked the first service this question and three people raised their hand. How many of you would rather be here than up north where all the snow is? Okay, we got a few more here. Good. Would you stand with us this morning? It is great to have you at Wings. We're thrilled to have you here, not only to hear God's word, but to worship with us. You know, that song, I love that song. It's Sing a New Song. And we're going to do that this morning later in our worship set. But we have a couple of songs that will be familiar to you. Let's pray to our great God right now. Lord, we love you and we honor you, God. And we thank you, Father, that you have brought us into your house this morning, God. Amen. Not just to be together, Lord. Not just to encourage one another, Lord. But to lift your name. To give you glory and honor and praise, Lord. Because you are the righteous one. You are the King of kings. You're the Savior and Lord of our lives this morning, God. We thank you, Lord, that your amazing grace, Father, makes the difference for each of us, God. It saves us, it renews us, it fills us, God, and it gives us hope for tomorrow, God. We bless your name this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone says, amen. Let's worship him together. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings yes, this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that i would be set free I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan, the son and daughter, the king of glory, the king above all kings? Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings Ooh, This is amazing grace This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross you've done for me we sing worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. Oh, that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. We 
that renews us, Lord, that restores us and refills us, God, when we're empty, God. Lord, for those who are broken this morning, I pray, Father, that you would restore them, God, as only you can do, Father. For those who are hurting this morning, God, I pray, Father, you would provide the healing that they seek. Lord, for those who are wayward and not sure what to do, God, give them direction. Lord, for those who are simply empty and longing, Father, fill them up with your graciousness and your mercy, Father. Use us, God, as you can can this morning, Father. May we be willing vessels 
for what you want to accomplish, Lord. Use us and restore us, God. Rejuvenate our spirits this morning, God. Hallelujah. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved treasures in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel for the world to see your life in me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like See you now. I can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down and raising up the broken to life. Amazing grace, amazing grace, how sweet. Saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. Oh, I can see the love in your yourself down and raising up the broken to life. One more time. I can see you now. I can see the love in your eyes laying yourself down. bow down before you and say every man will bow down and say you are king 
So let's start right now. Why would we wait? King of glory, fill this place. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. Just wanna be with you. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are King. So let's start right now. Why should we?
just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. One more time, King of Glory. just want to be with you. King of glory, fill this place. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. I just want, I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. Open wide the gate so that the King of glory may come in. Let him fill you today. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he can fill you today. Let that be your heart's desire. Let that be your heart's cry. Just to sing out to him. King of glory, fill this place. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. I'll sing it out. King of glory, fill this place. I just want to be okay to sing out today come on sing out today in your own way yes Lord we praise you we glorify you we magnify you today Lord yes Lord we love you Oh, we need you in this place today. Yes, we do. We just want you. Yes, we want to be with you, King of glory. Oh, just want to be with you. Yes, we do. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you grateful for his presence today? Hallelujah. 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 He's here today. He's here to fellowship with us, to meet us 
in a powerful way. And I want to share this scripture with you. It's a very familiar scripture. Then we're going to go into a time of prayer. Jeremiah 29, 11, the prophet Jeremiah is writing a letter to the exiles here. And this whole chapter is just an awesome encouragement from the Lord that he's sharing here. But in the 11th verse, this is very familiar. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So we always have hope today. We always have a future because the Lord has plans for us. The Bible says that the steps of a good and righteous man and woman are ordered by the Lord. But I want to go on and continue here because it just gets better. Verse 12 says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, the first part of verse 14 says, I will be found by you. He's here today. See, we've been worshiping. We've been welcoming him to come, to touch, and to move in this place. He's here. Look at your neighbor and say, he's here. He's here. What is he here to do today? He's here to touch you today. He's here to speak to you today. He's here to deliver you, to save you, to heal you. Whatever you have need of today, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father who is in heaven above. He is here today to bless you. He is here today to help you. He is here today to be your way maker. Whatever you need the Lord to do, he is here today. I believe it. I know it. And I am here to believe with you because there's power in agreement. And what we want to do is we want to take time to pray right now. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for needs. We want you to be able to join your faith with us today that you might receive something from the Lord. That you might receive that answer that you've been looking for. That miracle you've been searching out. God is able to do something great. And as we've come together, we've been seeking the Lord in worship. Now let's do as the scripture says. When we pray, he listens. He will answer those prayers today. So if you have a need today, I want you to lift up your hand. We're going to pray for you today. If you have someone that you want to stand in for today, lift up your hand that you want to say, I have a burden for them and they need prayer. They need a miracle. So look around you, church, all of these needs around us. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray together. We're going to bombard the heavenlies together in prayer in faith, believing that God will begin to touch each and every situation and he will begin to move aside every roadblock the enemy has put in your path today. How many believe that? Let's pray together. Father, pray with me. Come on, pray out with me today. Let's make some noise. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Hell trembles at that name, Jesus. There's healing in that name, Jesus. There's power in that name, Jesus. There's deliverance, there's salvation, there's whatever we need is through the name of Jesus because he is the one that made a way when there was no way. He is the one that hung on a cross. He bled, he died a cruel death that we might live today, that we might be able to receive something in his presence today. So Lord, we pray together in the power of agreement, Lord, that you would touch that you would save, you would deliver, you would heal, whatever the need is. We pray right now together. Lord, we pray right now together by faith. Lord, we know that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith goes beyond the natural realm into the realm of the supernatural. So we declare these things today in this place. We declare that the King of glory is here today, that in his presence, We can see all of these needs met in the house of the Lord today. And if you believe that one more time, put your hands together and bless him today. Bless him today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I believe in it. I believe in it today. Look at your neighbor and say, I believe in it. And as you do that, begin to just love on them today. Hug their neck, shake their hand, and bless them in the name of Jesus. Welcome to Wings of Faith Fellowship. We are a church that loves God and loves people, and that means that you are welcome here. Please take this opportunity to pass down the attendance books. And if you're a first time guest with us today, look for one of those white connection cards, fill it out, bring it to the Welcome Center after church, and we'll answer any questions that you may have. And as a bonus, we have a free gift for you there. Today is Global Outreach Sunday. We want to thank you for your consistent financial and prayerful support of our missions ministry, not only here in Ocala, but around the world. Today, get one of those Global Outreach envelopes in your bulletin and put it in the offering, and this will help us continue to do what we're doing. Today is the deadline for our Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Project. So please make sure you turn those in today so we can send them out to bless the lives of children worldwide. Make your plans to attend our annual churchwide celebration for the Thanksgiving holiday. Roasted turkey will be provided for this meal. However, we ask each one of you to bring two generous dishes to share with your family and the church families. Everyone is invited to this festive event. So come celebrate the Thanksgiving season with us as a church, and I also hope that there's some pecan pie. For more information about how you can connect, grow, and serve with us, please visit wingsoffaith.com. Good morning. I, I believe we forgot to pay the light bill. It's a miracle. Let there be lights, what I should have said. See, and you'd have thought I was a prophet this morning. 
Hey, uh, let me see those hands again. Uh, how many veterans do we have in the crowd today? Any, any veterans? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. You know, it's a strange thing. I, I spent 11 years in the National Guard, and uh, I just never felt like a veteran. You know, I had a brother got shot up real bad in Vietnam, got the Purple Heart, and, you know, was in battle and all this stuff. And I'd never, I've never been, uh, you know, into another country and, and fought or had to really put my life on the line. So... You know, every time I hear a word veteran, I think, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm even be worthy to be called that. But I was thinking about that this morning, it being Veterans Day and all, and, and the Lord just spoke to my heart and said, you know what, son? You are a veteran. And he said, you, you know, this, this fact of, of going to another uh, country and putting your life on the line or making yourself available or being, being ready to do something for the kingdom, uh, you are a full-blown veteran. And I, and I think we've got veterans right here in this congregation. Uh, if you've ever been at, uh, on a mission trip to another country of any type, let me see your hand. Oh, look at here, look at here. This is what I'm talking about right here. So I want you to, I want you to get a grasp of that today. It's, uh, you know, as we look into, for a moment here uh, into our, our global outreach that we've been doing, what, what God has used us all for and how he has... Uh, we've made ourselves available, and he's done some awesome stuff. Uh, Pastor Rocky in the first service, and I'm sure he'll talk about it uh, today, he was talking about the body of Christ, you know, and he, we read scripture about, you know, the ear and the, uh, uh, you know, the eyes and the, the, the feet. And, and I was thinking as we was reading that, Pastor Rocky, you know, the big toe is the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. If, you just, if you'll just take your shoes off when you get home and prop it up and start t staring at your big toe... It ain't a sexy thing, I can tell you that right now, right? And I was thinking I was thinking about that, and I'm like, but you know what? I read one time an article, without your big toe is your uh, basic balance on your body. You lose your big toes, you don't have balance. You just start falling around and tripping and all this stuff. So as ugly as it is, it is uh, very profitable. So what I've got, what am I saying here? As ugly as you are, <laughs> you are very profitable to the kingdom. So don't, don't feel like you're nobody this morning. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but I had, I had to gouge you just a little bit. But I want us to look, uh, look at a couple of things. We just celebrated about three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, we celebrated uh, our 20th year of ministry uh, in Cuba. It's right when we started building this building here, we started uh, doing ministry over there. And uh, we were over, we met in three different parts of the country, and uh, we had over 1,400 of our leaders that came together uh, to be uh, recognized and to be uh, and just to worship and to just to praise the name. This is, this is one of our services that we had here. Let's look on here a little bit. We went to three different locations. This was outdoor. You can't tell. It's kind of dark, and that was our third one. But uh, run that back to that second one there, if you would. I want to. I want to tell you. I had a, an amazing thing to happen to me. I was. I was in the uh, little pastor's house that was sitting right next to it, and we were having the service outside. And they were all went all the way back out into the street. Had those big old speakers cranked up, and these p people were just worshiping the Lord and unintimidated. Is what I want you to understand, because. The word on the street uh, right now over there to all the pastors that there's a lot of extra persecution that's coming down because of all the Venezuela uh, conflict that's going on and, and the preachers are just having to kind of back off when they're preaching. And, uh, and So we're outside. And, 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 and by the way, these are four-hour services. You know, start at 8 o'clock and just run wide open, you know, to, uh, for four hours. So, I mean, we're just, just getting it for four hours straight. And... Uh, they're not intimidated. So I'm sitting in that uh, little house looking out the window, and I'm, I'm seeing these young people, I mean, you know, in their 20s and their 30s uh, with their hands up, you know, and just uh, worshiping God, tears running down their face. And it, it just dawned on me. You know what? This right here, my friends, is what it's all about. It's about planting seeds. It's about encourage, encouraging individuals to serve the Lord. They don't have anything. They don't, they don't have any money. They don't have uh, any transportation, very little. They don't have, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the big boy toys that we call it that we have here. 
But you know what? When they find Jesus Christ, when they hear about the Lord, they're so hungry and so willing to go and to do. It's like, it's unbelievable. We had, uh, let's, let's look on here. I want to show you uh, some, we gave out over 40 uh, plaques. And you can see them right there. This is uh, one of our uh, groups. Over 40 plaques to uh, men and uh, some women that had has spent over 15 years or longer in the ministry over the 20 years that we've been there. So uh, let's, let, I want you to see one uh, presentation right here. This is, you probably recognize a couple of things in that. Yes, that's me. That's my son, Jonathan. Yes, that's us money. But I want you to look at the, the, the bronze eagle in the middle. Those of you that were here when I finished my 20 year of uh, ministry here, Y'all gave that to me for my 20 years of, uh, of uh, hanging tough and just being here and being a part of what was going on. And uh, the Lord really spoke to my heart. I was trying to come up with something that would mean something to Osmani. And trust me, that, getting that eagle into Cuba was not easy. You know, uh, you ever, you know that, that's our kind of our thing here. We're known as the eagle, you know, in the U.S. And I'm taking it in communist uh, Cuba. Uh, so I had to do a little bit of praying, a lot of praying, and a little bit of this, a little bit of that to get that in. But I gave that to him, and I said, Osmani, I'm passing the torch on. Uh, 20 years of uh, service is when I got this, and I'm passing this on to you, and I want you to, I want you to make sure that you pass this on to someone else. So, you know, just think about, as we look around this morning, these flags on the walls here. You know, it's not for decoration. It, there's something behind each one of these. We're doing ministry. We're reaching out. We're touching. Uh, just like next week, we're, we're taking the team in. Uh, several of you are going uh, into uh, Nicaragua. And then the week after that, we've got a group going in uh, uh, over to Peru. And uh, several of you are involved in this. And uh, this is what it's all about, guys. It's about making yourself available. Uh, you are a veteran. You, you, know, you, may, not, you may not realize it. Uh, but, but if you've gone over and you've made yourself available, how about those of you that's never been that gives? I tell you all this all the time, and, and you know this. If, if you don't give, we can't go. Uh, and when we get there, we don't have anything to do, uh, uh, build facilities or whatever. And, and this is important that we understand. God needs all of us. Yes, even the big toe, right? <laughs> Whatever, you might see yourself as an ear or a mouthpiece or sometimes, you know, uh, it does get down to that big toe. You feel like insignificant, but let me tell you something. We got to have balance in this church. We got to have balance in God's church and he needs all of us for ev all the time for everything. So as we look at what God's doing and what he's, how he's ministered in, in, with, with, with Cuba for 20 years, I, I can remember the first time I went over there, it was like, God, why am I even here? What are you up to? Well, this is what he was up to 20 years later. We see over 1,400 leaders. We're working with 26 different denominations over there and hundreds of pastors across the deal. And we've trained hundreds of uh, uh, husbands and wives to go out and evangelize. I'm not talking about I gave him a, you know, a, a pop quiz for one day. I'm talking about a year and a half to two years of, of, of teaching and training and educating and prepping himself to go out and make a difference in the kingdom. So I want to I just encourage you today you know, to see yourself as a warrior, to see yourself as a, as a veteran, you know, uh, see yourself as someone that, that's willing to go into combat, willing to go into battle against the enemy. You know, and, and some of the uh, best warriors I've ever been around is prayer warriors. Do you pray for our missions here? Do you pray for God to, to bless those that's on the mission field? Do you pray for God to continue to just uh, allow us to plant seeds in the countries that we're going into? You know, it's crazy. And it, right in these conferences here, uh, Pastor Rocker, we had five different countries that was involved, you know, from, from you know, from the DR, they sent the leadership in. We had uh, from Cayman Islands had leadership in and, 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 and just on and on and on. From Peru, we had the, the strong man from Peru that, that was in this meeting. I mean, he's, he's literally one of these guys that can, 
uh, tie a rope to a motorcycle and hold it in it and hold the rope in his teeth and, and make that motorcycle stall out. And he's that, he's that kind of a guy. Uh, I gotta tell you this story real quick. He was going into the prison there in, in, uh, in Peru and it's one of the worst prisons, the meanest prisons they say in the world. It's so bad that the, uh, the, the guards don't go in that the, the prisoners kind of run the show on the inside. He wanted to go in and, and, and do a, uh, start a Bible study. And they said, man, those, those, those guys will wipe you out. And he said, well, let me worry about that. So he goes in and he, he, all, they're in there, you know, they all gruffed up. Who do you think you are? He's like, I'm going to tell you who I am. Next Thursday, I'm coming back. And I want you to get the three baddest dudes in this prison. And I'm going to take them on anything goes. You know, except for weapons, of course. And, and he's a little short guy, but he's bad to the bone, Pastor Rocky. So he goes back on next Thursday, and back to back to back, he took on the, the bad dudes in there and just destroyed them, just crushed them down. Well, guess what? When he walks in there now, it's yes, sir, and no, sir. When he says, I, I need you to listen up, I want to read you some scripture, they're listening up. So Pastor Rocky, if you're having a little problem with respect for attention... <laughs> You just get up when I leave and sit down and you challenge this congregation. Get the three bad dudes and bring them next Sunday and we're going to rumble right here, right? I set him up for success everywhere I go. Y'all just don't understand this. But So that's the, that's the kind of a ministry that we've got going on over in Peru. We got just God's doing some awesome stuff. And when I say we, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about those big toes out there, right? I'm talking about anyone that gives, anyone that goes, anything that's happening. Let's, let's roll on here because I want to talk a little bit about uh, Honduras real quick. That's one of our guys you can see. They were just, just, uh, uh, just on fire for God and was humbled by their plaques. But in Honduras, as you know, we've had groups to go over there. Uh, teams have been several times, I know three or four times, and we've had work groups to go in. And... Uh, uh, this is a group of 80 kids came in, spent two nights in, uh, in our bunkhouse, Pastor Rocky, that we built a few uh, weeks ago. And, of course, they uh, busted up into groups and had different kind of uh, skill setting sets that they were doing. And uh, out of that 80 young people, they were 7th, 8th, and ninth grade ages. Out of the 80, 50 of them received Christ. Now, what you think about that? Amen? 50 people. 50 young people. But I want you to under, understand something. We didn't just go out there and say, hey, uh, 80 people, come on in here. We've been working with these 80 people. Uh, our teens have been in a lot of their villages. They've gone in there and painted uh, schools and cleaned and worked and shared the good gospel. Our, our men have been in there and done buildings, and we've gone into the, in, into the schools and preached and shared. See, you just don't... You just don't jump up and grab someone by the throat and say, you know, uh, it's kind of like when I worm my dogs, you know, I, I get them like this and I push their gums into their teeth and I get their mouth open and I take that worm pill and I take this finger right here. You might want to use left hand shake with me from now on when you hear this. And I ram that all the way down in their throat. I don't ask them to swallow it. They have to because I've just poked it to right there. And we can't do people like that to get them to receive Christ. We have to love on them. We have to go in and, and do like the teens have done, you know, go in there and worship with them and play games with them, whatever. Like the men of this church is doing, going in there and, and build, and we've taken uh, medical supplies in and doctors and nurses, and this is what ministry is all about. So I want to encourage you to continue to plant seeds everywhere you go. Continue to be a giver to the kingdom. Continue to understand that you're not a nobody. You know, don't feel like I do as a, a, a you know, spending 11 years in, in the National Guard not even feeling like a veteran because I hadn't gone over and, and put a bayonet on in front and put it in somebody's face or something. You are a veteran of the kingdom Amen. as you give, as you plant seeds, as you make yourself available. So I just want to encourage you this morning to keep on keeping on for the kingdom. Hey, I love you, and I thank you so much for what you've done here in this church over the past 20 years. That's why we were able to do what we're doing in Cuba. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Johnny. We can call him pastor. We can call him encourager. We can call him missionary. 
Now we call him Enforcer. <laughs> he shared this morning a little bit with you about Honor of the Father Ministries. It's one of the mission area ministries that we support that go around the world. Plus, we have some local missionary ministries right here in Marion County. And every second Sunday, we have Global Outreach Offering. This is your opportunity to give to missions along with your regular tithe and offering. And we know how important it is to give to missions. God has blessed this church. We have a heritage of giving to missions. So we encourage you just to continue to give uh, in this offering along with your tithe and offering today to our missions. Last year we raised almost $250,000 by your giving to missions. So we are a blessed church. God has blessed you because of your giving. Amen. And uh, as you prepare to give, there's different ways you can give. We make it easy for you. You can text to give. You can give uh, by just putting your check or cash in an envelope today. The ushers will receive that in just a moment. You can also go to wingsoffaith.com. So we make it easy for you to give. Amen. So let's just bless the Lord today with our giving. Let's pray over this time of giving that God will bless it, multiply it, and use it for his glory, not only here in Ocala, but around the world. Amen. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for many, many blessings that you've already blessed us with. But Lord, as you blessed us, Lord, out of that blessing, we're going to give something back to you, Lord, uh, that portion, Lord, that we know that we give. We give our tithe, we give our offering and we give our missions offering as well. Lord, we pray today, God, that you will use what we give to continue to help us to build the kingdom of God. Lord, as we are giving particularly into missions, Lord, the souls that Pastor Johnny was talking about today that are being saved in, in Cuba and Honduras and Peru and Nicaragua, all the places that just honor the Father goes and all these other missionaries that we send forth Lord, we are a part of that. Lord, we are a part of the harvest of souls here in the last days. And we thank you for that. Pray that you bless the gift and the giver today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. In all of 
things. One, the church's annual uh, Christmas dinner theater uh, tickets are on sale, but also, you know, for a number of years, our choir has, at Christmas time, taken their Christmas presentation outside to the city park, uh, to the Citizens Circle, I think maybe one year, or the uh, downtown courtyard, but um, we're oftentimes getting hindered because of the weather and uh, so this year we decided to step it up a notch and so we have rented the Riley Art Center uh, on Wednesday and Thursday uh, December 18th and 19th and our choir and orchestra we're going to have uh, about a 50 piece choir and orchestra and they're going to be sharing the Christmas message uh, in song it's going to be a free event we're going to have we have about 2,000 tickets that we've printed. Uh, we'd like for you to take them. 
Begin to share them with family, friends, co-workers. Just invite them out to a great night of Christmas music. It's going to be a great, great time. And uh, so join us, help us out. It'll be a great opportunity to, for you to invite someone to church without them going to church. Uh, just come out and hear wonderful Christmas music. And I uh, promise you they will be blessed. Amen. Let's stand together. So good to see you in the house of the Lord today. To all of our guests, we uh, welcome you and just want you to make yourself at home. We're continuing in this theme, We Are the Church. And uh, our main theme text found in Matthew 16, 18. I'd like for us to read this out loud together. Let's read this together. I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Also going back and touching on this passage found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning verse 12. And uh, it's kind of a lengthy text, but I want us to read it together because it really helps to illustrate exactly what we're talking about as we talk about the church. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 12 here, 15 verses we're going to read. Let's read this together. Just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable are... Where did I lose it? Presentable. Are treated with special honor. All right. Modesty. Pardon me. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body but that his part should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And finally, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Turn to someone and say, we are the church before you're seated. Amen. need to go back to reading class. <laughs> Amen. Anybody ever heard of Connie West? Kanye? 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 Kanye. Kanye West and his gospel choir made an appearance on the Late Late Show with James Corden. I didn't know there was a Late Late Show. Who stays up late enough to watch a late, late show? Anybody? Oh, yeah, our kids. Oh, some adults even in there. Wow. Well, Corden presented a twist on what is known as his carpool karaoke, and Wes shared how he sees God working in his life. So at the end of the carpool karaoke interview, Corden wanted to know what Wes would say to people who don't believe that he's had a true spiritual awakening. 
West answered by emphasizing the difference between being asleep and awake. He said, people who don't believe are walking dead. They are asleep. But this is the awakening. Kanye West, one of America's right now, one of the most you know, well-known, popular uh, musical artists. Uh, rapper, is he a rapper? Never heard any of his music, so I, I don't know. But I know that he's very well-known. And, uh, and I also know a couple of weeks ago, Rebecca uh, shared with me a video. I think maybe somebody, maybe it had been posted uh, on Facebook. Uh, Kanye West, first of all, uh, claims now that he has a personal relationship with Christ. He is going all over our nation holding Sunday services. And at these Sunday services, uh, he is taking his pastor with him. And his pastor is preaching literally to crowds of thousands that come out to these Sunday services led by Kanye West. Amen. I listened to one of these messages a couple of weeks ago, and, and I mean, it was a rock solid, no, you know, hold everything yes. in it kind of message, and uh, strong, strong, strong biblical uh, message, and, uh, you know, some would say, well, let's just see how long it lasts, you know, has he really had a genuine conversion uh, experience, uh, or will he go back to his old ways? I did hear him uh, in an interview this past week where Kanye West, evidently his latest album, uh, album, album, al- al- album that, he, that he's created um, is called Jesus is King. Is that right? Every song on his latest album is a worship song or a Christian song. And I heard him in an interview this week that said he will never, ever write or sing another secular song, that all of his music will be Christian Uh, music or glorifying to God. Amen. Now, again, there would be some that might question, well, you know, again, is this really true? Is it real? You know, see how long it lasts, all of those kinds of things. But the reality is God can take anybody, someone like a Kanye West who is living for themselves, living a totally secularized lifestyle, a sinful lifestyle, And if he could raise him up, he can raise up whoever he wants, right? Amen. And the point that I'm trying to make today is that we are the church. And that we as a church, the church is alive, right? God is doing some neat things. In our nation, we heard about what he's doing in places like Cuba and Honduras and Nicaragua and Peru. Uh, I don't know that Pastor Johnny mentioned it in this presentation, second service, but we have a couple of guys, Pat and Kyle. Are you guys going to Peru? When is that, two weeks? In about 11 days, they're going up in the mountains of Peru with a team of people that uh, we discovered just a couple of months ago in a, in a previous uh, missions excursion to a group of people who have never, ever heard the name of Jesus. That's the church, the church being the church going to places, telling people, bringing people uh, to the knowledge of of Jesus and what Jesus can do in and through their life. We are the church. The church is, by definition, again, in case you've not been here over the last number of weeks, the, the church, by definition, is called out. We're called out from darkness. We're called out from our sinful life, and we're brought into relationship with Christ, God bringing us to himself through Jesus. Today, I want to specifically talk about this subject that I've just simply called spiritual genetics. Spiritual genetics. Genetics is the study of heredity and the variation of inherited characteristics. From a human perspective, it would be like the study of your family tree. Has anybody ever done a a study of your family tree? Um, I was walking through the big, big quarter at the New Orleans Superdome back in 1992. I was there for a big church conference and I was looking for something to eat. It was lunchtime and I was looking for, you know, I was open because when I go to the, you know, football games and baseball games, stuff like that, I love to get those foot long hot dogs with sour crowd and all that kind of stuff on them. Anybody feel me? You know what I'm talking about? 
just give me a great big hot dog with sauerkraut and mustard, you know, all over it, and I can, I can make a mess. I was walking through the corridor of the New Orleans Superdome, minding my own business. I was by myself. Rebecca and the children stayed home that particular time. And walking through the corridor, and this lady's walking toward me, and all of a sudden, she lets out a blood-curdling scream. Ah, you know? And she comes running up to me and grabs me and gives me a big hug. And I'm like, I'm standing there like, frightened, like, who is this woman and what is she doing, you know? And as she grabs me and gives me this great big hug, she says to me, you have got to be David Strabel's boy. Well, yes, I am. That's my dad. She introduces herself to me. She was a, a lady that had grown up. Her father and my grandfather were farmers and par, uh, partners in farming back in the day when they farmed with mules on 40 acres. She and her 11 siblings grew up next door to my dad and his seven siblings. They, were all, they all grew up together. They, they were like one big family. Well, there was something about me. Maybe it was my hair. I had hair back then, 1992. <laughs> Maybe it was my hair, maybe it was the way I walked, my facial, you know, uh, expressions, whatever. Something about me said to her, I know who this is. I know his dad. There was something about me that displayed to her characteristics that I had inherited from my father. Well, in a spiritual sense, that's exactly what we're talking about here today. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. So that when people look at us, they don't just see us, Amen. they see our father. Hallelujah. He's my father. Yes. Amen. Amen. So there are genetics. There are spiritual genetics that are at work in my life. Yes. But let's see this from a natural perspective for just a moment. So we think about the part of genetics that they talk about, the theme of genetics is nature versus nurture. Both are at work in all of our lives, each and every day of our life. You see, we were born naturally into this world. That's a part of our nature. Uh, you're here today because you're alive, right? Somebody, anybody? by live? We're all here, we're breathing, we're alive. We're here naturally. We have a birth mother and a birth father somewhere. Even if you don't know them, the reality is you had a mother and a father. And as a result of that, that's brought you here. But even though you are alive physically, naturally, you are a part of an environment. You were nurtured in this life. Some of us were nurtured better than, than others, but we were raised in a nurturing environment. Jesus describes it like this to a man, Nicodemus, in John chapter 3. He said, Very I tell you, verily, truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Well, Nicodemus' is teacher, he's trying to rationalize this. He says, wait a minute, how does it? So he asks this, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Any mothers in the house this morning? Any baby that you gave birth to was too big, wasn't it? Four pounds, five pounds, 10 pounds. Think about giving birth to a 150-pound adult. I don't think so. Or a 200-plus-pound adult. No way. So Nicodemus is obviously asking, how can this happen, naturally speaking? Does a person go back into the womb of their mother to be born? But Jesus goes on to explain no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the spirit. For flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. So you should not be surprised by saying you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear it sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. So we're talking about the church is made up of people who have encountered spiritual genetics. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, the scripture that we read said that we were all baptized by one spirit. 
We're all a part of the body of Christ by one spirit. And the body of Christ, again, I emphasize, it's not the name over the door. The name over the door simply says this is where the church meets at Wings of Faith Fellowship. Or this is where the church meets at the Church of the Springs. Or this is where the church meets at Good News Fellowship. Or First Presbyterian or First Baptist. But we are the church. If we've been called out from the world, if we've been set free from our sins and brought into relationship with Christ, we are the church. Baptized by one spirit. We all have the genetics of the living God, living, dwelling uh, in us. So think about this for just a moment. When a person is born into a natural environment, immediately this child becomes a byproduct of the nurture that he receives. If he's raised in a healthy, nurturing environment, he's going to develop into a healthy child. Now, your mind may go other places, but this is just my simplistic uh, mind. I just began to think, well, what kind of environment is necessary for a person or a child to be raised in and, and be a healthy child? First of all, I thought, well, you know, a child has to be fed a proper diet, right? Um, you're not going to feed an infant child a, you know, 15 ounce ribeye steak. Now you can feed me one and I'll enjoy it. <laughs> Just put it on my plate, I'll take care of it. But you're not gonna feed that to an infant. You begin a child with a food that the child can, can eat. Starts with a, the mother's you know, milk and then it goes on to you know, baby cereal and then you're beginning to open baby jars and, and giving it vegetables and, and different things until you grow it up to a point. But, the, the reality is, again, you're feeding this baby a, a balanced diet, proper food. Another thing that's very important for a child uh, is rest. You know, uh, I remember when our children were small that uh, they would sleep about, you know, 12 hours a day. Not all at one time, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, uh, Smaller children need more rest. Well, we're still told that, that we have to have a certain amount of rest in order uh, for us to maintain a healthy, uh, you know, physical uh, well-being. So, uh, but rest, rest was important. Physical touch was important. Social interaction, education, financial well-being. Well, the environment that a child is nurtured in then leads it to all these different experiences. So, for example, when a child is, is eating, it's, it's one thing just for a child to be fed. It's another thing for that child to experience eating, say, as a family. Does anybody remember sitting down as a family and eating together? I want to tell you, if you're young families today, you need to make that a priority. In too many families today, children just go to the refrigerator, get what they want to eat, and, and go on their way. Families aren't spending enough time around the dinner table. Well, what happens when you're eating together, you're fellowshipping together, you're talking to one another, um, you know, you're finding out what's going on in one another's lives, uh, you're making family plans together, but when you just eat and you scatter, I, I've known families that, you know, they'll get their meal and they just sit out in front of the television and, and eat their food, maybe they're together in the same room while the television's going. That's not healthy. As a family, you need to sit down as, as a family and eat together. There's a lot that takes place and it promotes a healthy, nurturing environment and experience for your family. Consistent sleep patterns. I've known children and adults, and I found myself doing this more than once, unfortunately, in, in my, especially in, in our empty nest, uh, you know, times now that Rebecca and I are enjoying, but you don't fall asleep watching TV at night. I do that. You know, I conk out about, I don't know, nine o'clock and then I wake up about 11 o'clock and go climb into bed. <laughs> but in truth, as a family, it's not good, uh, you know, to, to just sit there and, you know, watch TV until late at night and mess up your sleep patterns. Uh, in my house when I was growing up, my parents made a big deal about this. 
uh, at a certain time at night, the lights went out. Amen. When the lights went out, you're expected to be in bed. Amen. And um, even as I grew up to be a teenager and, and had my own automobile and could come and go, you know, a lot and was gaining in my independence, there was a time where the front door was locked, the lights were out, and you better be there or else. Amen. And uh, one time I missed it by 10 minutes. My parents were very strict. I paid the price for those 10 minutes. And um, I'll never forget the night I graduated from high school. I was 18 years old. I thought, man, I'm a big shot now. I'm about to, you know, leave. I'm going on my own. And I decided I'm staying out till midnight. Well, lights were out at my house at 11 o'clock to give you a time frame. And uh, I come sneaking in the basement door. My mom was waiting on me. Those of you that know my short little five-foot mother. And uh, she didn't care that I had two friends with me. She let me know that's not what we do at our house. In no uncertain terms. Physical touch, every family. Nurture an environment for a person. You know, families are different. Some are more touchy-feely than others, but there needs to be a certain amount of physical touch. There needs to be a certain amount of social interaction that can be accomplished through education, common interest, sports, so forth, so on. I watched uh, the other day a, a video of an eighth grade girl that won a National Science Award. She came up with this idea, this creative camera that was on like the outside of where the bar goes down from your windshield to the main body of your car. Anybody else see this? This young girl, 14 years of age, came up with this idea of this blind spot, a camera, on the bridge that goes down from the roof of the car to the body of the car, camera on the outside that then reflected over to the driver's side, back across, and presented the picture so that you could see in real time what was going outside, what was going on outside your car where that um, uh, bridge comes down. 14-year-old girl came up with that. And when they were interviewing her, what did she do? She began to talk about her family. And I listened to that and I thought, that is exactly what I think of when I think of a person that's raised in a healthy, nurturing environment. A 14-year-old girl that's neglected, left to herself, not given attention to, not having proper social interaction, not having good education, not getting good rest, not getting, you know, all of these things that I've been talking about is not going to be able to function in that kind of capacity. Do you get what I'm saying? Well, just as we think about these things from a natural perspective, all these things are also true spiritually. It's time for us to open our eyes and connect the dots. We are the church. We have a spiritual genetic makeup. And just as we've come through the nature, naturally we're born here, just as we are nurtured in a, you know, hopefully a healthy environment, so also spiritually speaking, we are supernaturally born and we are supernaturally nurtured by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we need a balanced diet as the church, not focusing on physical food, but, but spiritual food, spiritual disciplines. Amen. It is improper for you as a believer to neglect taking care of, your, of yourself as a believer. Amen. You need the study of the word, the reading of the word. You need prayer. You need fasting. Uh, you need solitude. You need these things as a part of your spiritual existence if you're going to have a balanced diet as a believer. Can't tell you how many times through the years as a, as a pastor, I've heard people say, oh, I, you know, I don't like... You know, I don't get into that prayer thing or, or I don't get into that fasting thing or I don't get into this or I don't get into that. I can look at that person and I can know right away that's not a strong, healthy believer Amen. because they don't have a strong, healthy diet. Amen. Let's be honest. That's good preaching, Pastor. Thank you. As believers, we need rest. Jesus entered into periods of rest. We need physical rest. We need spiritual rest. Solitude is a very spiritual experience. Jesus went to the mountaintop to pray. 
Moses went into the wilderness. Jesus separated himself from the crowds, got in the boat and went out into the lake. Why? To get away from the crowds for rest and for solitude. When you get to a place where you can just rest and you can decompress, all of us need this. It's a part of being the body, taking care of the body of Christ. Amen. We need solitude. I'll never forget when I, uh, one year I was out in the mountains of Colorado, uh, big game hunting. By the way, it's good to see uh, Ray and his wife Carmen here. These, everybody remember my son-in-law, Caleb? We have Caleb's uncle and aunt that, that are here with us today. So good to have you with us in the house. Don't mean to embarrass you. I was out in the mountains of uh, Colorado, big game hunting, and um, I was sitting on the side of this cliff, dangling my feet over the edge of this cliff several hundred feet down. I was, I was just, you know, the cliff went down, but I was looking out across the vast expanse of the wilderness there, and while sitting there, thinking about everything that I should be doing. I didn't have time to be out here in the middle of the wilderness. 43 miles off the main highway, back up in the middle of the mountains, trying to get my first, you know, big elk. And um, just sitting there in my mind, thinking all the things. I have service, two services to preach tomorrow. I've got this person maybe in the hot, you know, whatever. I mean, my mind is just going all of these things that, that I need to be doing, and I'm out here wasting my time in the middle of, of this wilderness. While I was sitting there, I felt very strongly. I know I've mentioned this before, but bears repeating. As I was sitting there, Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, who should be enjoying this more but those that give me praise for it? Because those mountains, I promise you, were full of partiers. You go to any hunting camp and find plenty of people sucking down a beer and just having a good time. But here I was sitting on the side of that cliff and I just began to rejoice and worship the Lord all by myself. I could shout as loud as I want to shout because there wasn't anybody near me for who knows how far. We all need that. Solitude. Rest. We all need physical touch. This is the reason why it's so important to be connected to a body. Those that say, well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Yes, you do. You need to be connected physically. The arm can't say to the body, I don't need you. The eye, the ear, the hand, the foot, as we read through this text. The body needs every distinguishable part because every part makes up the body. It's not, you know, uh, a bunch of amputated parts all functioning out there on your own. No, we're to be connected. Through our spiritual genetics, we need physical touch. I need you, you need me. Amen. It blesses me when I see you come through the, the doors of the church, every one of you. And I hope that when you come in here, you're blessed to see me. Amen. Has got a sermon for us today. <laughs> we need each other. Our social interaction, being connected together, where we fellowship, we break bread together. Yeah. The early church, that's what they did. They met daily and they broke bread together. Amen. I told Brother Bruce, where's Brother Bruce at? Over, sitting over with his lovely wife, Vicki, took me out to lunch the other day and, and uh, told me, get whatever you want on the menu. And I'm, you know, it was at Sonny's. Anybody like Sonny's? <laughs> so I got me a rib plate. Enjoyed some good St. Louis dry rub ribs with hot sauce on it. I walked up to Bruce just a few minutes ago. I said, man, I'm still in a hangover mood from those ribs the other day. <laughs> but that's what I'm talking about, being connected, social interaction, getting together with one another. Yes. And it, from a natural perspective, your family as a child growing up, and even today, you need social interaction. You need to, to connect with one another. Socially yes. speaking, yes. the same thing is true as it relates to the body of Christ. We are the church and coming together, gathering together, worshiping together makes us all understand what we need from one another in that social Amen. interaction. Amen. Help, Lord. Jesus. Help. Thank you, Lord. My third and final thought. Divine versus divisive. Divine versus 
divisive. You see, again, we're part, the gen our spiritual genetic makeup makes us all one in Christ, makes us all a part of one body, baptized by one spirit, born by the spirit of God. But look at what Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians 12, the latter part of the passage we read, verse 24, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. See, the reality, we are divine. Divinity lives in us and should live through us. But if we're not very careful, if we don't honor even the slightest member of our body, then we bring division. Anybody ever been a part of a church where there's division? Churches have divided over the color of the carpet. There's been division over church because somebody was sitting in somebody else's seat. There's been division over the church because somebody likes this pastor more than that pastor. Or this worship leader more than that worship leader. Or, you know, I don't like that kind of music. I like that kind of music. And the list goes on. Anytime you see division among the body... What is really being stated is that you're not giving honor to the body. You are no longer focusing on the divine nature of the body. If you take your eyes off of the divine nature of the body, the body of Christ, I'm talking about the church, then all you're doing is you're looking at the church from a natural perspective instead of a supernatural perspective. Yes. But we are divine here this morning. We are part of the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Baptized by one spirit, the spirit of God. So when we lack the honor, when we don't give honor where honor is due, then again, division comes. Yes. So true. We tend to honor those that seemingly carry the, the most weight. For example, maybe as a pastor, I get maybe more honor than, than others of you within the normal church, church body. But you know, if we're not very careful, we take that again too far. Amen. Because we're blessed to have people that that clean this church yes, yes. week in and week out. Aren't you glad that when you come to church on Sundays that the chairs are lined up and the floors are clean and whatever trash you left, by the way, stop leaving your trash in the, in the pockets and the chairs in front of you. The gum wrappers and the leftover bulletins and, and whatever, candy wrappers and whatever. That's not what that's for. Pack it up and take it home with you. Or put it in the trash can in the lobby. Amen. Amen. But I'm blessed that we have, and we're blessed that we have people that come through and check that and clean that and make sure all the cards are right and the envelopes are right and the chairs are straight and the floors are clean. How many of you appreciate when you come to church and you walk in and you find nice clean restrooms? Amen. Somebody cleans those toilets. Somebody mops those floors. Now, you don't think about that. You don't think about bringing those kind of people up on, on front of you know, the platform and, and recognizing them or giving honor to them. But that's exactly what God is saying. God gives honor to those who lack honor, to the smaller parts, because we tend to neglect those things. I was watching a football game with Rebecca last night. Her team is Clemson, uh, go Tigers. And uh, they put the whipping on North I turned off at halftime. It was already like 45 to nothing. Uh, so, but just before halftime, the coach put in a deep, two defensive linemen, a tailback and a fullback. The tailback was a 330-pound defensive lineman. They were two yards out from the goal line. They put these two big boys in, and they carried across the goal line. They scored... The last touchdown of the first half. 
Anybody see that game? No Clemson fans in the house. All right, that's all right. We won't hold it against you. So Rebecca asks me, the question, why did the coach do that? I said, he's honoring his players. Everybody's always making accolades and honoring the great quarterbacks, the great running backs, the guys that are scoring the points. But these big old linemen, they're down in the trenches. They're digging it out. If they weren't doing the blocking, if they weren't doing what their job was, then these great quarterbacks and great running backs would not be scoring those touchdowns. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. The same thing is true in the body of Christ. Yes. You may feel insignificant. You may feel like your $10 a month offering to missions is not significant. But let me tell you, when $10 is added to $20, is added to somebody else's $100 or somebody else's $1,000, when it all comes together, Amen. it Amen. meets the need. Yes. You may feel like, well, you know, I, I can't teach or I can't preach. But whatever you do, it's okay. Whatever you do, you do it unto the Lord. And the body is built up and the church is healthy. Amen. Amen. Last thing I'll share, Pastor Kevin to come. I was reading an article in Christianity Today. And the title of this article, very interesting. The title of this article is Meet the Mini Church. Meet the mini church. Not many as in M-A-N-Y, but the mini M-I-N-N-I-E. Anybody ever heard of mini? Mini Mouse? Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse? I never thought of before, did not know existed, but there is a church at Disney World. There's a church that, at Disney World that is called the Cast member church there's a pastor at Disney World that left a lucrative pastoral position at one of the largest churches in our country said God called him to go to Disney World who ever thought of Disney World as a mission place I certainly haven't we took Caleb and Julie Ray and, and their little daughter Rayleigh just a few months ago when they were here visiting us it's been a whole whole day at Disney World. Somebody walked by with a t-shirt uh, that basically said they spent more money than any other day in their life. And I'm like, I identify with that right there. <laughs> but this church at Disney World where this pastor, it's not for the guests. I mean, the, how many tens of thousands of guests go through Disney World every day? Not for the guests that come on to Disney World property, but for the people who work there, the cast members. We go to Disney World and we see all of the characters, but there are people behind those characters. People that are just trying to live, make a living, earn enough money to pay the bills. Real people with real problems and real needs. Everybody from all over the world comes and just expects to have a great, glorious time. And the people, because it's their job, they try to provide that. But the reality is they're people who need to be ministered to. So this article is all about meet the mini church. Very interesting. Christianity Today, November 2019 issue, if you want to look it up. It's a great, great article. But as I was reading through this article, I read a statement. That's it. Listen to this, I quote. Disneyland artist Charles Boyer's famous riff on Norman Rockwell's self-portrait. Where Mickey Mouse looks into the mirror and sees Walt Disney. Mickey sees his creator in the mirror. Mickey sees his creator in the mirror. 
When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Do you, do you just see yourself in all of your shortcomings and failures? And what you lack? And I look in the mirror, and I'm not as young as I used to be. I have gray, I have white in places. Less hair than I used to have. My chest has fallen into my drawers. I look in the mirror from a physical place and I can see everything wrong. But what God is calling us to do is look in the mirror. When we look in the mirror, we need to see Him in us. We need to look beyond who we are and our shortcomings and failures and all that. We need to see what God is doing in us and what God is doing through us. We need to see that we have spiritual genetics at work in us and God is trying to work and nurture us and develop us and Help us to be the people that he wants us to be, living and moving and acting on his behalf so that also others, when other people see us, they see past the natural who I am and they see Jesus in us. They see God being glorified in the things that we say and the things that we do. And what my heart is today in sharing this thought with you is that if we could just be the church, if we could just be the body, that nurtured body that God is trying to nurture and raise up. Caring for one another, loving one another, being there for one another, every part being honored and cared for. Then guess what? The world will beat the door down to come and be a part of something like that. Amen. Give God praise. Thank you, Lord. Where it doesn't matter how young or how old or whether you're black or white or Hispanic or Asian or whatever. Jew or Gentile, slave or free, the scripture said. We are the church. Let's let people see Jesus in us. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. For our altar team elders, staff would come. If you're here this morning, I have a special need or desire someone to pray with you, please feel free to, to come. If you don't feel that you're part of the body, if you haven't made that decision to follow Christ, it's always a good day. Always a good day for that. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss in prayer. And, and uh, But if you have a need and want prayer, please feel free to come forward. Even as others are leaving, please do so quietly and reverently. Please do not stay in the sanctuary and hang out in fellowship. Please take your fellowship outside the doors so we can get ready for the next service, the Spanish service. All right? Lord, thank you this morning for this opportunity we've had to just join together, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to be a part of the church, the body of Christ. Lord, we're so thankful. Lord, continue your work in us and through us. Help us to be, Lord, all that you'd have us to be. We thank you for it. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you so much. Thank you for being with us today. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Till we meet again. God bless you.